Hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 41. Uh, an excellent show lined up for you today. Thanks so much for joining us. Our guest tonight is Rosemary uh, Watola Tromer. Um, she's one of, the, one of my favorite poets, and um, I just love her work. I, I read three of her books today, and they are all excellent, so you are in for a treat tonight. Now, our warm-up poem tonight I thought we would do, just as everybody gathers around the old computer screen, is... Um, I just thought we'd do today's uh, Poets Respond poem. There was the featured poem on Tuesday. This is by Sony Greenfield, who will be the guest in June. And um, our prompt poem for today, if you um, haven't done it, um, you still have uh, about an hour left if you'd like to submit one. You can send that to openmic at rattle.com. But our prompt poem today was a run-on sentence poem. And um, this, I don't know if so, if, if um, Sonia uh, did it for the prompt, or if it just happened to be a run-on sentence, but the, today's featured poem happens to be a run-on sentence. So I thought that was some kind of karma that we needed to acknowledge and, uh, by making that the warm-up poem today. So this is um, uh, Sonny Greenfield's poem, um, Japanese Aquarium urges public to video chat eels who are forgetting humans exist. And, um, and it's based on this, you can see on your screen here, this is an actual title from an article in The Guardian uh, of the same of the same title, sensitive creatures who are starting to hide when keepers walk past as a result of the lack of visitors is the subtitle. And then it goes on about how the Tokyo Aquarium, uh, these garden eels are getting scared of people because they're not, haven't been seeing people lately. So uh, Sony Greenfield wrote this poem uh, for Poets Respond, and it was today's featured poem. And I thought we'd share that as the warm-up poem as we get started here. So uh, here's Sony Greenfield. Uh, reading, Japanese Aquarium urges public to video chat eels who are forgetting humans exist. Here we go. Japanese Aquarium urges public to video chat eels who are forgetting humans exist. The Guardian, Friday, May 1st, 2020. Hey, eels, a.k.a. carpet of writhing grass, a.k.a. sinews of seafloor, a.k.a. silver, speckled, and smiling sand spitters. The world has gone bonkers, and even humans can forget humans exist, like that tiny grandmother whose white hair looked like a moon, jelly bobbing in the dry ocean on the other side of your glass. She's gone now, and the nurse in subtitle scrubs, that soothing blue, is gone too. Hey, eels, we have a sickness rippling through this sea of humanity, so I'm taking a Zoom meeting with you. Can't roll up to your window and smile back. Can't be jostled by a family of seven edging me away from my vantage. That's how we are, we humans. We're just like animals. Hey, eels, I like how you duck into your home in the sand, how you suck yourselves into your safe spaces. And now humans are doing that too, sucking into our safe spaces and shrinking away from faces coming too close, which is to say, I'm just like you. Hey, eels, beyond your invisible walls, beyond the four walls, beyond your aquarium, beyond the teeming of Tokyo, I hear wildlife is reclaiming its spaces, that pumas wander the streets, that waterways are becoming more uncluttered by the detritus of human indifference. Hey, eels, every time I would take my son to see you, he would sit by your side, and I think he saw something of himself in the way you're alone in your hole and in the fear that guides your hiding. Hey, eels, it's where we all are now. Thank you so much, and that was Sonny Greenfield with her poem, um, Japanese Aquarium urges public to video chat eels who are forgetting humans exist. Um, and that's one of those poems, I, I don't remember who it was, was talking about, was it George Bilgier or was it Charles Harper Webb? Was talking about how humor, um, you know, sort of like there's like a rope it up strategy where you set people up with humor and uh, then you hit them with a real deep meaning. And um, that poem, I thought, it wasn't really with humor, but it was just this these really cool um just sort of flourishes of really great language, the the silver speckled and smiling sand spitters. And then you keep going through these images 
And um, then it hits you with some real meaning at the end. So that was a great poem I thought we would share today. Uh, something in the universe wanted us to do that. Um, and that was Sonny Greenfield, who will be the guest sometime in June. I can't remember which date it was. Maybe June 21st, if I remember right. But um, thanks to everybody for joining us. I see a whole bunch of people here on um, on YouTube. Let me see who. Yeah, we got a whole bunch of people on Facebook, too. So hello to everybody. Now, our guest tonight is Rosemary Watola Traumer. And, um, oops, I just dropped her book on the floor. <laughs> but, um, uh, she lives in Southwest Colorado with her husband and two children and served as the third Colorado Western Slope Poet Laureate from 2015 to 2017. Her poems appeared on uh, in O Magazine, in a Prairie Home Companion, and in Back Alleys, and on River Rocks. Uh, she has uh, author of 12 collections of poetry, I think it is, uh, including Hush, uh, which is the most recent one, not quite yet out, and Naked for Tea, which came out from Abel Muse pretty recently along with a whole bunch of other books. Um, she's also performs with the Telluride's Eight Women a cappella group Heartbeat and sings nightly for her children. Uh, since 2005, she's maintained a poem a day practice, and uh, her, she has an MA in language and linguistics. Um, her favorite one-word mantra is adjust. That's the bio from her website, which you can find at wordwoman.com. All one word, just like it sounds, wordwoman.com. And uh, here she is, Rosemary Traumer. And don't forget to unmute your microphone. <laughs> Rosemary, hi, hi there. Hey, hi, how you doing? How you doing? I'm good. I'm yeah, good. It's great to finally see you. The first time, I never knew, I wasn't familiar with your work. And then you won the Ekphrastic Challenge one month. And I remember very distinctly, someone said, um, someone replied and said, well, if Rosemary is submitting, how am I ever supposed to win? <laughs> and that was my, <laughs> and then I started reading more of your work and, um, and really enjoying it. Um, a wonderful poet, and um, really glad to have you on today. Hey, thanks, Tim. It's a delight. And I've loved watching these before, and, you know, I admire so many of your guests that you've had, and it's a thrill. It's a thrill to be well, here. Well, these are a lot of fun to do. I really, you know, it's a highlight every week to get to meet someone new. Um, so looking forward to sharing your poems. Um, do you want to start with a poem to kick off, um, and from which book? Because yes. there's a lot to choose from. You bet. Um, let's start with Naked for sure, Tea. Yeah. Uh, and I thought we'd start with the first poem I ever s submitted and got into Rattle, oh, okay. which is on page 15. And um, it's got a really long title, <laughs> which I kind of enjoy having super long Just titles. Like David Wagner yeah, exactly. <laughs> once said something about how he likes, he thinks that all the information that doesn't belong in the poem belongs in the title, mm -hmm. so you can just get it over with. So this is, here's a really long one. This is After My Friend Phyllis shows me the New York Times headline, Lou Michaels, all-purpose player, dies at 80, missed kicks in the 69 Super Bowl. When I die, let them write about all the mistakes I've made. Let them mention in the headlines how many rejection letters I've received from the sun. Let them say, Mr. Calling for Broadway back in 1987, let them say she trained hard, but she never did win a Nordic skate race. They can note how my children fought in front of company, how every chocolate cake I made sank in the center, how the beets in my garden were never bigger than golf balls, how I never even watched the Super Bowl that's true, not even once, much less knew who played for the Colts back in 1969 while I was still forming in my mother's womb. And Lou Michaels missed two field goals that helped the Jets win. What do any of us really accomplish? My friend Wayne says, we do what we can and have mercy. Yes, let them say, I did what I could. Let them say that I loved the best I knew how and messed that up too. It's what we do, we who are kicking our way to the back pages of the paper, well-intentioned and foundering, faithful and confused as we are, we mess up. Yes, mercy on us, mercy on all our failing little hearts, how they beat so sincerely in mercy on this longing to shine, to be brilliant. This reminder again, 
to Neil. Thanks, and that was a poem from Naked for Tea. I won't read the whole title again, but after my friend Phyllis shows me the New York <laughs> Times obituary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, an excellent poem. Yeah, that was the first time. Was that the first? I think that was the second time we published you, actually. To be oh, honest. was it? Yeah, I think the first time was the ecrastic challenge for the div- divining, which we read on the last week's show. You're yeah. right. You're totally yeah, right. So, so called you out already. It's, it was a gotcha question. <laughs> you are right. I, I, yes, that's true. Yeah, that was number two. But um, yeah, a great example of, of sort of the way that you work. Um, what do you think, uh, what draws you to poetry and why, why this form? Oh, gosh. Well, um, <laughs> partly because I, I, li- I like being efficient and I think poems are efficient. <laughs> My friend Peter Heller was teasing me the other day about how I'd said I would never, ever write a novel because a poem can do in 10 lines what a novel does. Uh, although now I'm writing a novel. Oh, are so you? you- <laughs> well, what's <laughs> but I what's think- the novel about? Don't, don't just drop that there. What, what's it? <laughs> oh, well, it, uh, it'll be under a pseudonym and it's, and it's romance. Oh, interesting. Yes, yes. Because I have children, no mm-hmm. one will ever know. Okay. Well, your I, secret I is safe it. with us and everybody watching. <laughs> Um, you know, there's so many things. I think part, probably, Tim, one of the biggest, I mean, the reason I got in in the first place was because of, it was fun. And um, in fact, I forget who it was recently on your show that said something about how how probably one of the reasons most of us get in is be, is through some kind of a trauma or, or difficulty. And I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just the exact opposite. That may be what kept me in. But what what got me in in the beginning was, you know, reading Shel Silverstein. It was so much fun. He was having such a good time and reading them out loud. I remember sitting on the couch with my grandmother reading these poems out loud and just loving them, just thinking, this is great. And I had my own notebook mm-hmm. and I'd carry it around. Um, what, what's it about, these silly what is it that's great? Like when you say it's great, like why, what yeah, is it that's great? I mean, I think, I think poetry is, is a playground for people who love language and, you know, the, the, the words are our toys. And then, and then you take these words and you put them together and you see how they hang out and how they sing if you cling them together. And, um, and then that play, when, when we can be in that space with it, then I think what happens is that when we meet difficult subjects, as we do, then, then we find that that willingness to, to, to follow what's happening can, can still lead us through difficult times so that, so that there's this pleasure in engaging and touching even the things that hurt the most. Hmm. Uh, that's such a paradox. And, and maybe that's one other thing. I mean, I probably have 29 things that I love the most (laughs) about poetry and one is play. And one is that paradox, right? That we can, that we can have so much pleasure and so much pain held in the same poem um, you know, like, like that quote, I think it was George Bilger who was talking about how the humor and the, and then, and then you hit him <laughs> after that. Yeah. And, and there it is again, right? How the same vessel and that's what's true in our own bodies. That's what's true in our life, right? In, in the same hand at the same time, we're holding incredible pain and incredible gratitude. And so poems are this glorious, super flexible, playful, uh, available, efficient vessel for, touching what does it mean to be alive yeah yeah they really are um i already mentioned your uh, the ted talk which i'd read um actually i think when when somebody said that to me you know um you know how do i get published when rosemary is one of my competition people um i went and googled you and that ted talk came up and i love that ted talk about um about meaning and frames and how you know and what poems really are i always thought it's sort of a magic spell that temporarily at least changes your frame on things mm-hmm. um, and, and through metaphor too. Um, so, mm-hmm. so can you just sort of explain um, how, you know, what poetry does in that way? Like how does metaphor work to, to alter your frame like that? Yeah. I love this question. I mean, obviously I care so much about metaphor and did that talk and I, I was a linguist, right? You know, I can't, this is the brain and all language actually is metaphor. You know, it's funny to me when people say, Oh, you know, I, I don't understand metaphors. Well, <laughs> If you are a language speaker in any language on the planet, you you speak in metaphors. That's that's what we do. All all language is frames, and uh, I, I love to explain it kind of in this way too. Like if you if you if I say to you, "Don't think of an elephant," this is the famous example by George Lakoff, the linguist. He's you've already thought of it. 
right? I, because I say don't think of an elephant, the frame is created elephant. Uh, it's the, And then what happens is that we tend to, out of efficiency, because we have to be able to move forward and, and learn new things, certain frames become more solid. And we cling to them. And they they happen fast. That's just the that's how the synapses work in the brains. So when we say something, this is, this was one of the examples that proved it most in my own life. And I talk about this in that talk about how when my son was born, he cried for the whole first year. And I called my girlfriend at the, and said, oh, I think I'm being tested, you know. And she said, Oh, Rosemary, it's not a test. It's a path. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was one of those moments where I really did understand how profound these frames are, how I had really believed that I was being tested. And if it were a test, I was failing. And you know, I was an, a straight A plus student, right? Like I want to do the best all the time. <laughs> Actually, I'm a failed perfectionist at this point. But, um, and, and so what, what was amazing to me about that was changing it to say, not a test, it's a path. And once I thought of it that way, I thought, oh my gosh, I always take the hardest, steepest, longest path, always. That's what I love, is that challenge. And then I thought, wow, yeah, that's what I was given in a child. I got a really hard path. And it didn't make it easier. He still cried and he was still, you know, I, I was still trying to figure out how to get him help. But it did change my whole orientation toward what motherhood was. So I think that's a, that's a succinct example of how just one word frames get in. Poems are just larger versions of that. So that we see, um, you know, we see uh, like that E.E. E. Cummings poem, Not Even the Rain Has Such Small Hands. And then, oh, we can, you know, there's a gentle rain and there I'm thinking small hands, small hands, you know, and I'm thinking about love and I'm thinking about touch and I'm thinking, you know, so I think that they, they get in there and they can shift us. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love coming to poetry yeah. is to, to be shifted, to have those brains, to be shown something new. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, that's something I forgot about that, but we have that in common too. Our daughter, Josefina, who's our nine-year-old now, about to turn 10, had colic too and just cried. If yeah. she was awake, she was crying. And then she would sleep for like a half an hour, 45 minutes and not be crying. And then she'd wake up and cry. And so we took shifts oh. and, um, you know, I got plantar fasciitis from like bounce walking around the house with her and um, (laughs) still to this day it took like 10 years for that to heal and um and it's it it is it's sort of like a i don't know it's like something a a path that you're given I, i really like that too from the talk um the other thing i was thinking about was just the way you know since you're a linguistic that the way um you know there's those studies about the way that we have our, like they'll show different things where you make a choice and your brain actually makes the choice and then you rationalize the choice afterward. Mm-hmm. And so, and so that seems like how it works to me. That's like, that's how the frame operates. Like you make the choice through your gut or whatever, you know, like, uh, like a, that great Stephen Colbert thing. I got more neurons in my gut than I do in my brain. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you make the choice through your gut and then your brain is sort of just like a rationalization engine that, that decides for you how to interpret that decision you already made. And so, and that's really how you can shift your experience um, through things like poetry and, and the metaphors that you use to um, to to explain the world around you. Um, do you find that you sort of handle things better being a poet? Like, like one of the things we've noticed yeah. is that um, you know, just interviewing poets over the years, and Alan and I talk about this sort of privately all the time, is that poets seem really like the most well-adjusted people. Like, there's the the theory. You know, the sort of the myth that poets are these crazy, <laughs> flighty people. But if you meet and talk to somebody, poets are the people who like really the ones that are successful and continue doing it are the ones that seem to have it like going on. Um, do you find that it's helpful to your own psyche to be a poet? Oh, there's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I mean, I, going back just to for a second to what you were saying about do you have more neurons in your gut or your brain? I mean, I think that the poem invites us to use both right? The poem is inviting us to be completely embodied, you know, all the sensory detail, whatever, and also to use our our brains and, and, and our feelings and our curiosity, right? Yeah. So I think that's, and maybe that's part of why mm-hmm. poems, the more poems I read, the more poems I write, definitely the more well-adjusted I am. I mean, I, I don't know how anybody goes through life 
without it. There, and the thing, too, I think about this all the time, Tim, about how the practice of writing the poems is actually the part that matters, right? That's what I care about the most. The poem is a, is a happy byproduct, but it isn't actually the point of it. You know, the point is that there is this daily momentary invitation to show up over and over and over and over and meet the world and to do it. I do it, you know, poets do it through language. That's what we, that's how we meet it. You know, dancers do it through dance or, you know, but I think that many of the arts have this same invitation involved and actually the sciences too, for that matter, this invitation just to show up, show up, pay attention, pay attention and to call on our whole body of knowledge to meet this moment and let it inform us. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And also, you know, you talk about the having poetry be in the body and the mind at the same time, or the gut and the mind at the same time. And I always feel like that it's a synthesis of the two. That is that feeling the, of um, Emily Dickinson said of taking the top of her head off. It's when we sort of, mm-hmm. you know, the two components understand each other for a moment, which is really rare right. in our lives. And that's the moment that you get from a great poem. Um, so why don't you read a great poem? Why don't you read maybe two poems <laughs> and... Um, Whatever you want, whatever you want to read, but we should get back to some poems. Okay, let's okay. see. Um, I'll stick. With, I'll stick with uh, the naked for tea just for a second, and then and then maybe we'll move into the other book. But right. how about? Uh, I, it's funny because Tim, I usually have them memorized, and I don't read them. <laughs> and now I'm a little nervous because I know people are going to be reading along, <laughs> and I think I stray pretty hard from. <laughs> Well, you know, it's kind of cool to see where people stray. Like, that's one of the things we noticed in the Slam Poets issue, was that the there's not a single poem in there where the recording matches the text exactly. Like, like poems right. evolve over time, and they're really not fixed on the page like we kind of assume they are. So uh, I, I say feel free to read them differently, and, and people can enjoy oh, okay. the subtle differences. Oh, good. Well, the last poem I read, I've actually changed the last line, but I did, I did the old last <laughs> line just because... <laughs> Everyone could see. Um, Let's do page 10, and that's uh, the title poem for this book. It's called That's Right. That's right. I have shown up naked to tea. I know it's not the proper thing to do. In fact, I am a bit surprised myself to be wearing nothing more than this pink scarf. I was wearing more when I left the house. At least it is soft, the scarf. At least it is warm, the tea. You don't have to pretend you don't notice. And I'll not pretend either. No, let's go on. That's right. It's a bit comfortable, I suppose, as all things are at first. We'll go on, maybe. By the time we pass the cream, you'll have slipped out of your own button-up shirt, your judgment your embarrassment, your belt, and maybe by the time we get to the bottom of our cups, we will wonder why we would ever spend an afternoon together any other way. That was uh, That's Right from Naked for Tea, um, which is sort of the title poem. The title is included in the poem. I don't know what you call it there. That's true. But um, I wondered why (laughs) is it Naked to Tea in the poem and then Naked for Tea? I was shocked to see that that's what it says on page 10. I've never said that in my life. I'm certain every single time I've ever performed it, I've said naked 40. That's funny. <laughs> um, that's very funny. Um, you know, it, I have a funny story about this too, just based on what we were just talking about. You, you know, I send these poems out. I send poems out every day. I've, I've been writing poem every day, as you said, for 13, 14 years. And when, uh, when I sent this one out, my mother had for many years been asking me to be on the list of the poem a day. And I waited years before finally putting her on because I didn't want her to have to pray more for me than she already <laughs> does. And of course she does anyway, but she usually is very, very, uh, you know, circumspect about her responses. But this one, I could just imagine her <laughs> Tim, typing, you know, on the, you know, as she received this poem the next morning, she writes, Rosemary Gale. I hope this is a metaphor. <laughs> and I assured her that I really hadn't shown up anywhere naked for tea. But but this one, this poem is really important to me, I think, because it points to vulnerability and a willingness to be vulnerable in the world, which honestly I think is well, that's how I take it 
the calling to be a poet is to be willing to show up vulnerably, to be willing to um, to experience that broad spectrum, right, of of grief and bliss and fear and courage and the whole, you know, to really stand in the middle of it all and experience it all. And um, yeah, I think that's really kind of our job description. Yeah. Um, um, the, um, I, I should say, uh, if anybody has any questions for Rosemary, you can leave them in the chat windows. I'm watching both Facebook and Twitter, um, or not Facebook and Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. I'm not watching Twitter because I can't keep up with more than two. But um, that sort of ties into something David Cook asked. Um, he says about your first poem, he said, with all the mercies, I was reminded of Catholic Mass, and you mentioned your mother praying for you too. Um, so, so, what is your spiritual or religious background, and, and does that tie into poetry? Is it is a spiritual process for you at all? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, with all those mercies, came from my friend Wayne's quote, mm -hmm. Wayne Muller, who's a glorious um, spiritual leader. Actually, uh, my own. I grew up as an Episcopalian, and my friend Jim Tipton, who's a glorious poet, used to call me the Episcopagan, and um, you know, I've, I've been working with a spiritual teacher for the last 10 years doing satsang, and it's, uh, it's a method of inquiry. Uh, and I teach, you know, retreats with Buddhist Dharma teachers. Uh, I don't have a, a specific path. I don't think mm -hmm. that I, I don't go to a specific church or I don't have a label. I would say I'm a this, but... I make time to be quiet every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I read poems every day. <laughs> the Dalai Lama says kindness is my religion. I think that I, I would like that to be true for me. Yeah, yeah, that resonates a lot for me too. I feel like like my only religion is that that all of this is an illusion somehow. Like like the you know the from the Eastern tradition. I don't know. I don't remember what the word is in Sanskrit for for it's Maya. all an illusion. Yeah, Maya. That's what I was thinking of. But um. Yeah, and then and then poems are kind of prayer to the illusion or to whatever is behind the, the illusion or, or whatever it is. Um, and then I think also a way of unlearning. I mean, I used I guess I really used to think that's a, that's been a massive shift in the way I thought about what poetry could do. And it happened maybe eight nine years ago where I really used to think that you could write poems to find answers. And now I really believe the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I really believe that that the more the poetry leads me into a greater unknowing and willingness to rest and, and hang out in that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. Well, let's keep going with, with some more poems. All right. Let's see. This is, um, let's do page 108 and naked for tea and then we'll, we'll move out of this book. But, uh, this is years later. I remember what he taught us. The guy had stabbed the small round of cactus with his knife, then held it up in front of him. With his other hand, he flicked on his lighter and burned off the spines. I do not remember the smell of it, nor how much it smoked. What I remember is how he was left with a smooth and harmless lump of green in his palm. He sliced it open and taught us to drink. It could save you he said, if you find yourself lost in the desert, do this. Burn off your spines. Whatever bristles you have grown to protect yourself, set them aflame. Open however you can. Let me pull you to my lips. I will do the same for you. We are all lost in the desert. That was years later. I remember what he taught us from... Um... Naked for Tea, which is available from Able Muse Press, which you can find at ablemusepress.com there. Um, so so what? where do you want to move next? Because we have a lot of different cool stuff um, to share. What, what, do you, what do you want to do next? Well, should we, let's read some, maybe some new poems that came, are coming out of uh, what's going on right now. Yeah, that'd be great. So, I, yeah, okay. Um. Number one, I want to thank you, by the way, for doing Poets Respond and for really giving poets a chance to show up in poetry and in, in a daily, you know, in a, in a really mom, uh, of the moment way. You know, all poets know that often when we send work out, it could be months, it could be 
many more than months before before a poem is published. And and poetry has that glorious ability to touch a moment in a way that a novel couldn't, for instance. Like it'd be very hard to write a novel about this time right now that we're in because we have no perspective on where it's going. But I feel as if poetry does allow us to touch it. You know, it allows us to touch these small moments of it in a way that when they're put together helps create a more cohesive picture of what's happening, especially when you get lots of voices coming together to say, you know, this is, this is what it's like from here and here and here and here. And we get all these different, you know, as Emily Dickinson says, my business is circumference. And the more voices we have saying, this is, this is the report from here, the, the, the more whole picture we have. Right. So I appreciate you doing that and creating the new poets respond yeah, on well, Sunday I too. appreciate if you, you're saying that because that's exactly what we're you know trying to do just having poetry be part of the conversation you know because there's so much conversation going on now um, and poetry should be part of it so um, yeah it's really it's really a pleasure it's my favorite thing that we do I think although I, I love these uh, I love everything we do so <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I do love you know I can say that it's my favorite whenever we're talking about it so yeah <laughs> <laughs> I have so many favorites yeah. too. It's a good thing to have a zillion it is, favorites. Yeah, yeah, and if it's not your favorite, you can just stop doing it, and then you're, you're full right. of favorites again. <laughs> you can get a new favorite. Exactly. Um, maybe let's start with quarantine, which is a poem that I wrote um, in the first week. Now I have a teenage boy. Anyone out there who has a teenager, or if you've ever been a teenager, you may recall that the one of the things that you most want is to be nowhere near your family. Um, and then comes coronavirus, and now all you can do is be with your family. Um, we're also, I think, very, very lucky, um, super uh, privileged, really, to live in, in the middle of nowhere. And so in some ways, it doesn't feel all that different, at least in terms of our environment. Um, you know, there's never anybody coming by, and there still isn't anybody coming by. It's, you know... The, the kids never went out to play with anyone else and they still can't go out to play with anyone else. You know, as a, so quarantine here where I live is, is quite, we're, we're in seclusion anyway, and now we're just even more in seclusion. Um, so I think that one thing that, that, well, this points to a, a sweet moment that's happened in the quarantine that maybe wouldn't have happened without it. Quarantine. This morning, my teenage boy and I sit quiet on the couch. He does not move to pick up his phone. I do not rise to work or rush to make a meal. We sit, leaning the trunks of our bodies into each other. We do not say much. I close my eyes and cherish his sapling weight. There are so few people I dare now hug. Our hands, our bodies, dangerous. But here in this house, so still, I can almost hear him growing. Here, in these minutes that fell off the clock, here, I remember how surely we baptize each other with touch. Such simple blessing. Silence. The metronome of breath, the leaning in, infectious love. It was quarantine, and that's um, on Rosemary's blog, which you can find here, 100 Falling Veils. It's 100fallingveils.com. Um, before we move on to the next poem here, I, I wanted to talk about about this daily blogging of poems thing. We talked about it a little bit before you came on air, but that um, you, know, you publish these poems daily, which given the publishing industry, um, is something that people might you know hesitate to do. So what's your what's your experience been? You know, because according to the sort of silly rules that we have about what counts as publication, which is I guess I mean technically there's a there's a definition of publication, which is to be made public. And with new technology, mm -hmm. anybody can make anything public at any time, which is an amazing thing. But so so there's a way that poetry has um, the poetry community has. Um, Know, not moved on with the times, I guess you could say, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, because it's not just, there's like different audiences. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. you know, your friends and people who follow your blog enjoy these poems, but then uh, other magazines might not want to publish them. Um, so what has your experience been doing this for, for 15 years now, publishing a poem? Mm -hmm. Is it every single day you publish a poem or have you missed days? <laughs> yeah, every day. Um, well, in the beginning, I didn't, 
I didn't put them on a blog. In the beginning, it all started. There's, there's multiple things here. Number one is why have a poem a day practice at all, mm-hmm. um, which is <laughs> I didn't think I could. Uh, it, it was an invitation maybe, well, 14 years ago or so, 20, 2005, I guess. Jude Jeanette, who's a glorious human woman's mystic poet, swirl of an energetic wow. Um, she had this class and she said, Hey, you know, I just finished writing a poem a day for 30 days. And uh, she put it out there as a challenge that other people should do it too. And I thought, Oh my gosh, I could never do that. And uh, she said, what you need to do is you need to pick two partners and you need to promise each other that you're going to each send each other the poem, you know, every day for 30 days. And uh, and the reason you have to pick two other partners is because one of you will flake out. So you need <laughs> to make sure that you have three of you and that keeps it a little bit more solid. So I chose one person I knew really well and I chose one woman that I really wanted to know and the three of us committed to it and we started on the on the equinox, the spring equinox. We had so much fun after 30 days, we thought, let's just go to the solstice. So we went for 90 and then they stopped and I didn't. But then come the next uh, spring equinox, they, or fall equinox, I guess, they, they picked it up again, and we did it for another 90 days. And then they stopped, but I never did. I, I guess but so many good things came out of it. And, I, you know, I said earlier how I think that the practice is the most important part, and I think that's what really helped for me. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm a failed perfectionist, and um, I think that – there was a long period of time where if it wasn't going to be good, if I wasn't going to write something good, then I wasn't going to write anything at all, which meant I could go for months without writing anything. And when I made that commitment to start writing every day, it allowed me to, I mean, I realized you're not going to write a masterpiece every day. You can't, that's that's impossible. So it took a lot of pressure off. It allowed me to, as William Stafford famously said, lower your standards this is the best advice ever because you you realize that you, you, there's so much freedom then, and the more free you are, the better you can write. Uh, there's there's the paradox, and and so I um, I ended up coming up with a couple of rules for for my every day. They kind of evolved out of it. The promises that I make every day is one: I will write. Two: It doesn't have to be good, but it has to be true. And by true, I just mean authentic. I don't mean factual. I just can't be writing it because it sounds good. Um, I have to really kind of, it, ha- it has to have juice and it has to have tug in it for me. Um, the third one is I can't know the ending when I start. And if I do, I have to write past it. Mm. And Or I can cut it off and write a second ending or third. Um, and the last one is I will share. And I really do think that that sharing piece is very important. I think that... Um, that we kind of breathe <laughs> writing poems is like inhaling. It's like taking in the world, taking in the world, taking in the world. And at some point that's untenable, right? And you need to, there's a cycle involved in it. And, uh, and I also think that there's, I was just thinking about this earlier today, that there's a witnessing piece involved, that when somebody else reads the poem or hears the poem, it, it, there's a, a seeing involved in that and a, a witnessing that, I don't know, it's an, it's a glorious exchange that happens, and I know it from both sides, what it feels like to be read and what it feels like to complete another person listening to them or reading them. Um, I just feel like it's a really important part of the process. So the blog evolved out then of, you know, enough people, I was sending it out to, you know, 50 and then 100 and then 150 then I was getting you know marked as a spammer so I started putting them on a blog uh, so that I wouldn't be a spammer anymore poetry spammer and I think that the I think it's kind of stupid really to put a first draft into the world every day because you're putting a first draft into the world uh, and sometimes they take off before they have wings maybe but I also think that that really reflects what I've chosen as a priority, which is to show up in a daily way and to allow other people into this daily conversation and to, um, the publishing part has really fallen away from me. It, It has in a huge way. I don't submit anymore to magazines who say it can't be previously published because it's not allowed. And instead I, know that I have thousands of readers every day. 
and I wouldn't have that if I were saving them for to send off. So I don't, I don't, I don't and I don't worry mm-hmm. about it. I don't feel any sense of loss about it. There are plenty of places who are willing to take poems that have been on my blog before. And quite honestly, they reach a much larger audience than, than small literary magazines do, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I've realized that, um, anyway, for me, allowing that practice to be the most important thing has uh, circumvented mm-hmm. the normal routes for publishing yeah, poetry. Yeah. The, the, the thing that, that sort of throws a monkey wrench into everything, I think, is the whole, um, it, it's the same in, in science or any other field in academia, but there's the publisher parish model. And so, you know, mm-hmm. having those credits that you can give to the, um, you know, tenure board or whatever is so important for um, for the majority of people who in the career path that they want to follow. So um, but, but I think it's great advice to, you know, just just to approaching poetry this way and um, and sh- and sharing it. And, and it's just the most authentic way that you can do poetry, I think. Um, do you I, I know you teach, but you don't teach at, at college, right? Do you do private workshops because you mentioned teaching at, at some point um mm-hmm. yeah I, I do a lot of teaching and i do i don't have a formal relationship with the university but i teach at universities when they invite me mm-hmm. uh i teach for local art schools i teach lots of private students i teach uh with the dharma teachers i have actually three um dharma teachers that i work with and do retreats and uh, I, you know, I, I te- really, I teach for any, like I, I'll teach for businesses. Mm-hmm. I have t- a couple of businesses that have hired me to do poetry with their staff. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of sweet to be very uh, free that way and available to, to saying yes to, for those, yeah, you know, schools yeah. and libraries. And I, you know, I, I feel as if teaching and it's kind of exciting now with what's happened with zoom. Uh, Cause I've had to, I, I rejected it for so long, I guess, out of fear, uh, because I didn't know how, but now I realize how exciting it can be to, to teach online and have people come from, you know, the Philippines and, and, you know, St. Paul and, and up in, you know, Toronto and have them all together. And wow, how cool is that? That's, that's amazing. Yeah. That, that word free is the word that I was thinking. And, and um, I, I think you're friends with Wendy Vitalock too, uh, who we yes. publish. All and she's another one. There's a certain sort of cadre of poets who seem free of that academic <laughs> track. And, um, and, you know, another one, Ellen Bass, we had recently who um, just doesn't, you know, she does her own thing and, and um, yeah. lives her own life and publishes her own books. And um, there's sort of, there's definitely a path there. Um, and, and last week, Danusha has her own workshops and, uh, Kim Benenizio, who we featured in this issue. So there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, you don't have to follow the the career path that um, you know set out before you in those programs um, for sure. Uh, do you want to, do you want to go on to the other poem, Other Shoes from the? Yes, okay. we can do that one. This is just from a uh, maybe last week. Other shoes, actually, and it came out of a class I was teaching <laughs> um, called How Shall We Live Now. Other shoes. Oh, and it has a this little epigraph from Carlos Santana. I'm watching his masterclass, which by the way is fabulous. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, it's thrilling. Do you play guitar? Is it a guitar class? I don't play guitar. It is a guitar Mm -hmm. class, but, but really it's a, it's a creative Uh class. Like he really is talking about creative process and everything he's talking about. I think, yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. Of course I'm thinking with poetry, but that's really cool. He says, uh, we all belong to the same galactic oneness. Other shoes. I could be the doctor who, overwhelmed in the ER, went home and killed herself. I could be the 16-year-old boy who had to cover his father with a white sheet before the coroner arrived. I could be the white sheet. I could be the lawmaker unable to sleep or her pillow that hears her cry out in fear when at last the sleep arrives. I could be the rhythmic hissing of the ventilator or the wail of the wife or the weary hum of the custodian beneath her mask as she wipes the surfaces clean. It could be me, the 11th death in the town next door to mine. 
It could be me, the one who unknowingly makes you sick, because I don't know I carry something deadly inside my breath. And so I don't hug you when I see you across the post office lobby, though my heart leaps up to hold you, because you could be the flat line on the EKG, because you could be number 12. I think that was a poem from Rosemary's blog, which of course you can find at 100fallingveils.com, and that's Other Shoes. Um, I should say too that 100 Falling Veils, that comes from a, a poem by Rumi. Ah, yeah, it sounded familiar. Um, that's sort of a good transition to something I wanted to ask you about, because you host a podcast too, which is um, Emerging Form, and uh, which you can find all over wherever you find podcasts, where you're listening to this, probably you can find it that there too. Um, and I listened to the very first episode where you explain where um, it comes from. And it comes from this, this line, obey the emerging form. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because that seems like a poem where you obeyed the form with that um, I could be refrain. Um, can you talk maybe about mm -hmm. how, you know, what that means to you, obey the, the emerging form, first of all. And then in that poem, how did that, how did that work? How did, that, how did you notice the form? And then how did you know to follow it, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So, um, Obey the Emerging Form uh, came out of this these sweet poetry sleepovers that we've had over here on the Western Slope that Wendy Vidalock is part of. Uh, it was Wendy, me, Danny Rosen, Art Good Times, and Jack. Um, I just based his last name. It's so funny. How silly. Oh, well, if I turn around, I could probably find his poetry book. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> well, that's okay. I can't remember my own name, so <laughs> I'm surprised that you... <laughs> he, this man is completely <laughs> beloved to me. It's it's like, un, this is one of those moments where it's like forgetting your mother's name. Um, is it Mueller? And I have like 17 books of his. Is it Mueller? <laughs> of okay. course it's Jack Mueller. And Jack Mueller... I have a lot of Jacks in my life. Luckily, I have a lot of very fabulous Jacks. Jack Mueller um, would use, he would take a, a, these, these three by five white blank note cards and a Sharpie and he would write on them, draw all over them. And he was just this total rapscallion. He was just gravelly and, and oh, a, a beat poet, was right? From a beat poet. He was yeah. a beat poet. Yes. From there in California. And, and he, um, he, he that night had written on one of the note cards, obey the poem's emerging form. And all night long, Tim, he walked around this, this party. It was, and it was a sleepover, right? We were there all night. And he's like, obey the poem's emerging form. And he all night long. <laughs> And, and I, you know, I joke that I've always had this terrible relationship with the word obey. But if there's anything that I would want to obey, it's it's the emerging form. So, and and what does that mean? You know, that means really to be in service to the poem, to let the poem know more than you do, to to be willing to show up and lose your ideas about what you thought was supposed to show up. And I guess it really is part of that that third promise of mine, you know, not knowing the end when you start. And I guess it's really also just about allowing authenticity to drive it and to not need to know where it's going. Um, that, pro that part can come later, right after you have finished and when you're revising the poem. But, but in that creative process to just really let the poem lead you, um, Jack used to like to call it the ambush. And um, it's lucky when it happens that way. And, and I think any poem, you know, when you sit down and you let yourself be led, in this case, the um, I could be, I could be, that was a form that came from a poem um, that I was using in his example by Alison Luterman. And she had written I could be in this, in this poem about how she could have been going to Hawaii, uh, but she wasn't. And and so I had given the class this, uh, this, this you know, prompt, you know, what could you do? What could you be? You know, and, and and what I love about the I could be, I could be, like any list poem, right? And this is it's just a list. So many of my favorite poems are just lists. And in this case, the poem is moving through these different it, – it, it helped me to 
move through these other stories of coronavirus that aren't mine. Um, because all of us are reading these stories, whether some, uh, you know, even if you don't know, you know, someone who's died, you, you probably know someone who knows someone who has, you know, you've certainly been reading about it in the news, you know, reading these stories about these doctors, my friends who are doctors who are putting themselves, in, you know, on the line every day when they show up for work. You know, I just have so much compassion, empathy, uh, gratitude um, for these people who are showing up in all these other ways. Um, so I guess that's what I loved about this. It could be, it could be, is that it allowed me to be both present where I am and explore the larger reality at the same time. Um, and then what was sweet to me as it continued to go, what, as I started, you know, you can see where it starts to shift, where it could be me, the one who's, the, who's dead. Uh, it could be me who makes you sick and, and shifting it from into that. I mean, that's probably my greatest fear really of, of this whole thing is that I unknowingly am the cause of someone else's suffering, which I, I would do anything not to be right. So, um, I have, I guess, other great fears too, but that's one of my greatest fears around this is that, that unknowingly I would, I would be a carrier to, to cause problems to someone else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was really grateful that this poem let that fear show up and, and let me explore that fear. Yeah. 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 Well, great answer. Um, let's move on. I wanted to, um, you sent this book just as a bonus, uh, you said. But um, but this book, um, which I can put on screen, even now, I just love. So I want to at least do one or two poems just to share from this even now book, which is there are three line poems and then three line. Uh, what is the word for the brush stroke paintings? Drawings. But, but isn't there isn't there a word for the ink? Sumi, sumi ink. ink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the word. Um, yeah. So there there are three line sumi ink drawings um, that you did with. Um, I put it on screen with Jill Sabella. Jill Sabella, yeah. And then this is the book Even Now. Um, do you have any, do you could want to read or share by any chance? Let's see if I have it behind okay. me. Okay. Because I just... You know, I don't have it with me, but it, you can share. Okay. You can share them. Okay, so um, I'll just read a couple, at, two at random. How about this? So this one kept, Perfect. um. let's see. Let me just see what is here. Um, try to get a good example. Um, well, I better just pick one at random. It's hard to, it's hard to decide, but, um, <laughs> but here, so this is this three line drawing. And then I throw my hunger into the river, then two alone jump in after it. And then we have this beautiful three line pen and ink drawing too, to go with it. And some of these are funny and some of these are touching and it's just such a great book of poetry. Um, and then here we have, um, these three lines and then empty pockets. This too is a gift. I'll read one more at random. Um, there, this is after swallowing the sea, still thirsting for a lake. So I just thought this was one of the most beautiful books of poems um, I've ever come across really. It's so unique. And um, I just recommend everybody to check that out. Is it still in print from, um, from Lithic oh, yeah. Press? Lithic Press. From Lithic Press. And who, that's Danny who was hosting those sleepovers. Ah, See how well, it all comes around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so these were, were um, you worked together with, with Jill Sabella. Um, how, did, how, did that, how did that process work? Um, how did you, you know, I think you, you went in both directions, like the poem inspired the yes, painting and then did. the painting inspired the poem. Yeah, we hadn't met before, and we were both part of a program where the artists, uh, artists and poets were told to connect with each other, and there was going to be a show that was at uh, Carbondale Arts. And so a mutual friend put us together, and we just started, we thought, well, we both like simplicity. What if we did these three lines? Let's just see what happens. We created 13 of them just going back and forth. Sometimes she'd send them the image first, and sometimes I'd send the poem first, and after we created the first 13, we, we enjoyed it so much and they all sold immediately. The artwork did and we thought, well, let's, let's do more. And so we did the 45 and, mm -hmm. uh, and had an art show and then Danny 
Danny picked up the book and it was one of those great joys really where where the collaboration drove the creativity I wouldn't you know I've been writing three line poems for oh I don't know but Jim Tipton who I mentioned earlier um, you know he really was my favorite three line poem writer and got me inspired to write very short poems and yeah, it was it was just so fun to play. There it is again. It was play, Tim. Mm -hmm. It was play. We were having so much fun. Even some of the more serious ones, you know. Um, Here, I'm thirsty, said my cheek to your tear. Yeah. You know, some of these were very, you mm -hmm. know, they were very serious or and you know, or crazy exuberant. But um, yeah, it was just a lot of fun. Yeah. It, it, I think collaborations when they're amazing. Mm -hmm are like one plus one equals, you know, seven million. That's how that yeah. one felt to me. Yeah. Well, I love how you bring up play all the time because I always, I've always felt that um, uh, the best book on, on writing or creativity of any kind is uh, Zen and the Art of Archery. And there's so oh. many great... Oh, I haven't read oh, it. Oh, you have to. Um, but, but so there's, um, you know, some lines like, um, you must hold the drawn bowstring like a, a child holds a proffered finger. He does not think I will grasp this thing and then grasp another thing. Um, I can't remember how that finished, but you know, simply without, um, I can't remember how it goes. But but I will just play with these things. Is how you know. And um, he says the right art. Um, I can't remember lines. My my brain doesn't work like that. But um, but check that out that book. It's such a great book for um, for creativity and, and it's all play. That's really what it is. It's sort of a, a spiritual play or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I, spiritual play. I have a, I have an entry for the for the today's theme. Okay. Um, the the one line, mm -hmm. the one yeah, sentence, the run on the sentence. Run -on sentence. Yeah. There mm -hmm. we go. Yeah. Okay. And it's on page sixty five of the new oh, book. Okay. Hush. Okay. Let me try to pull it up. Um, and I'll just say about hush. Um, it'll come out sometime in the next month. I'm pretty excited about it. From Middle Creek Press. Uh, what page did you say that was? I, I lost it. And it's on page 65. 65, okay. Um, mine only goes to 57. Is he? <laughs> oh, oh six, 65. Mine only goes to 57. Oh, what? wait, no, I see. Sorry. These are, uh, oh, each page okay. has two pages. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that makes yeah, it tricky. Yeah, okay, let me, uh, let me try to find 65. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> Your poem is not as long as you think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, um, I'll just say about Hush while you're finding it that uh, it's all, um, they're all poems of human ecology. So it's very different. Okay. It feels very different to me than any of my other books. It really does focus really completely on the natural world and our relationship to it. Yeah, um, it's a kind of a yeah. That's what I was noticing. Really, it's a very nature-based, um, you know, a lot of yeah, yeah, which is something that we all need in this in this life now. I have it now. If you're if you're ready to go. Oh, okay, good. Busy girls, Satori, which is kind of like a awakening, right? Across the yard, below the cliffs, and just beneath the evening's drift toward darkening, above the river, through the trees, there is, if you are lucky. A slender moment, charmed by chance, when, if you look up, the great blue heron will angle past on slanting wing and make you question everything. Yeah, that's busy girl Satori, and it definitely will, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so this book is, um, it's about to be out like in days, right? If it's not quite available yet. It, it'll be out in day. I bet it's three weeks. Oh, three, yeah. Yeah. Um, and where can, where can people find that? Like uh, through your website? Uh, you can find it on the publisher's mm -hmm. website, which is Middle Creek Publishing, or you can find it on my site, which is wordwoman.com. And are these poems that were part of your everyday poetry, um, Mm -hmm. do, do you um, find yourself that you workshop or, you know, like, you know, revise these poems as you go? Or do you, or do oh, some yeah. poems well, stand I, out and then you just run with it like it was? Yeah, both. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure, both. 
sometimes, um, you know, I, I definitely, I, the, the whole rule, I break pretty much all the rules, you know, everything, the show don't tell, you know, no, the show and tell, you know, write what you don't know, you know, write what you don't know. Um, and the one, you know, you're supposed to, you know, not edit as you go. Oh, totally. I edit as I go. Absolutely. I do. And then before the poems go into a book, yeah, for sure. They go over the, then there's a revision process, mm-hmm. which is more rigorous for some of them than others. Yeah. Obviously, most poems don't go into a book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you want to read maybe two more? We have we're, we're sort of approaching out of time, but but let's do maybe two poems to to finish it out. All right. Let's do um, page twenty two in Hush. This is one that I wrote almost exactly a year ago, my dear friend, um, student friend, beloved Sally Estes. Um, found out that she had cancer, and I wrote this the day she told me. They say it's the best bloom in 10 years. She wants to go see the blue bonnets, she says. This is after she tells me she has three months to live, and I want to find her vast fields of blue bonnets, acres and acres of white-tipped blue bloom. And I want to send her more springs to see them in, more days to live one day at a time. I want to remove the pain in her belly, the pain that aggressively grows. I want to make deals with the universe, want to say no to the way things are. I want to tell death to wait. I want to tell life to find a way. I want to hug her until she believes she is beloved. I want to give her the pen that will write every brave thing that she's been unable to say. There are days when we feel how uncompromising it is, the truth, how human we are. There are days when blue bonnets stretch as far as the eye can see. There are days we know the most important thing is going to see them a billion blue petals all nodding in the wind, teaching us to say yes. That was They Say It's the Best Bloom in 10 Years from Rosemary Watola Traumer's new book, Hush. Um, let's see, I haven't done a good job of, of asking, passing on questions. I've kind of been distracted this whole episode. Um, let me see if there's anything I can pull up really quick. Um, let's see. <laughs> so the, the the first question question mark I found is your poems seem this is a Julie Kim Shavin she says your poems seem effortless are they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, that's an awesome compliment. Thanks, Julie. And um, uh, no, but yes <laughs> and no. <laughs> you know, I think that there's a. I'm open to them. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I'll sit and be open to them for hours yeah, and hours. Yeah. Is that make, like? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, something about writing, you know, a poem a day for for almost fifteen years would be, uh, would be uh, how many would that be? Four, five, it's almost fast. five thousand poems. And so <laughs> there's that whole ten thousand hour, you know, philosophy. Is that Malcolm Gladwell or I don't know, I remember who yeah. does that? But um, right. but yeah, you must have the ten thousand hours down. And so um. Oh, for yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, there's that meme that I saw because I'm a terrible, uh, I can't draw w- whatsoever. And there's some meme that was around a while ago that was like, um, you know, like, wow, you just have such amazing natural talent. And then at the the yeah. bottom panel, they say, no, I just spent 5,000 hours drawing the same stupid eyeball <laughs> over and over again. Right. And um, I think it's probably that. I mean, that's kind of how it works. Right. So <laughs> I want to say something to that. You know, I really believe that I have no innate talent with poetry that I, you know, I was a total math and science girl. I was, I was, went to school to be a doctor and that changed, you know, but I don't, I I was, I wasn't, I loved poems, but I was terrible. I was terrible. And, but I love them so much. And I just, I I really believe that with our devotion and hard work, we can overcome lack of talent. (laughs) I just don't think talent is, it'd be great, but if you don't have it, that doesn't mean anything. Just keep doing it, doing it and doing it and studying it and loving it and touching it every day. I I really think, I really think that's important. Yeah. Well, that's a great lesson to pass along. Do you want to close us out with one last poem? One last poem. 
Um, so from Hush, this is page 43, and it's called Big. And uh, obviously I wrote this before COVID, but it couldn't be more important to me now. I feel like it's the, the invitation I really need to step into, all of us really, big. This is perhaps the year to learn to be big. Spruce tree, big. Cliffside, big. Big as Mesa, as Mountain Lake. Big as in cosmos, as in love. Being small has never served me. Constricting, contorting, trying to fit into a room, into shoes, into a name. Let this be the year to escape all those little rules with those little shoulds, all those little cages with their little locks. Time to make of myself a key. Time to lean into immensity. Time to supersize communion. Time to grow beyond self. Time to open, to unwall, to do as the universe does, accelerate as I expand, not rushing toward something else, but changing the scale of space itself. Poem. That was big from Hush. Uh, Rosemary, thanks so much for joining us today. It's really been a pleasure um, and um, hope you can join us soon. Looking forward to seeing your book in print. <laughs> thanks. I'll get you a copy. Yeah, too. Thank, yeah that was a little hint. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. <laughs> well, uh, have, yeah, have a great night, Rosemary. Thanks again for joining us. Oh, thanks so much. So much fun. Yeah, thank good you. night. <laughs> yeah, so that was Rosemary Watola Tromer uh, reading from her new book, Hush as well as, um, well, her almost new book, Hush. Um, her other books that I have here, which we showed today, are um, Even Now with Jill Sabella, um, and that's from Lithic Press, which you can find at lithicpress.com. And uh, her book before that, or I guess after that, is Naked for Tea, uh, this book here. And uh, that is from Able Muse Press, which is um, another one of my favorite presses. I think you know, Alexander Peppel does such a great job. Um, and it's a, it's a formal poetry sort of leaning uh, publication, Able Muse. And it's really one of my favorites. So um, check that out, ablemusepress.com. And of course, you can find Rosemary uh, in all her poetry. And we didn't really talk about her podcast, but you can find her podcast, too, at uh, Word Woman. Dot com all one word just like it sounds wordwoman.com and um now if you enjoyed the rattlecast please do uh click the like button and share uh, rattles a publication of the rattle foundation a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry and we are unaffiliated with any other organization and uh, we just do it because we love poetry so if you do please do subscribe and click share now we're not done for tonight yet because we're going to do the um um, the prompt poems for tonight. Now, I didn't get to write one this week. I had a, I had a really busy week getting the uh, issue to the printer. But uh, this week's prompt uh, was the run-on sentence poem, as we heard the, the opening poem, and Rosemary had one. And um, if you would like to call in, um, let's see... Now, Joshua Corwin asks if he can call in, but I think, because he, because we're not doing a regular open mic anymore. It's only for these prompt poems. So, um, Richard Westheimer would like to call in. Hi, Richard. Uh, let me put this up on screen for everybody to see. And by Rosemary. Um, and now, if you'd like to, um, if you sent a poem, uh, you can send it to openmic at rattle.com, email it there. Uh, then send a, a chat message over Skype to me at Rattle Poetry, all one word, or give me a call at 818-850-7727. Let it ring a few times, and I'll call you back at the right time. I'm about 30 seconds or a minute ahead of you, so it'll be a little confusing, but just let me call you back when it's time to get with another uh, poet. But we do have a bunch of people who um, sent poems in, so if, if nobody wants to call, well, let's just take a call right now. This is a 305 number. I don't know who I'm going to be talking to. Um, hello. Yeah, this is... Yeah, I just figured I'd pick up. Uh, let me pull you in so everybody can else, else can hear you too. Um, hey, so I'm talking to Frank Ortega now on the line from... Um, is it somewhere in Georgia? 
right? Savannah, Savannah. Savannah, Georgia. Yeah, good to hear from you. Let me pull up your poem. Yeah, this is exactly how we want to do it. So then I don't have to have to set anything up, <laughs> which is nice. So so I think the possible prompt poem for the week would be the one to do, right? Morning in a silent okay. Savannah quarantine? Well, yes, except that, that, that I had written you, but you probably didn't see it. Mm-hmm. That that was one of that was uh, two weeks ago a um, uh. um, a prompt poem. It happened to be a sentence, and I didn't realize it till you put out this prompt. <clears throat> but I wrote another one. Okay. Well, which one you would you write? On that? Which one would you prefer? It's totally up to you. Morning. Morning is definitely more apropos. Okay. Perfect. And it's one yeah. Sentence. Yeah. Well, you were. Yeah, and you, I didn't plan it. It just <laughs> came out that way. That sounds good. Well, you were honest about it, so that's totally fine. So let's. Oh hear. yeah. No. 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 <laughs> Please. Uh, okay. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's the best po- only policy. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. Morning in a silent savanna quarantine. This little green lizard just being on a branch behind the rusted wrought iron fence in the yard of that strange old house that always seems empty on the ancient square in savanna. We pull down our colorful cotton masks, stopping to watch and breathe, just like this lizard, how his body blends with the green leaves and his tail does a tapering off in color to perfectly match the bark of the quivering twig how he watches us as we watch him flowers open all around us holding still in the moment this moment where parking downtown is suddenly free but nothing is open and there are no cars no people Just this moment together where we can forget everything, then hold it still some more admiring awareness. And then he turns his head to look back up and is suddenly at the top of the branch, munching on a bug, grasping all he needs for existence in the blink of an eye, someone's lifetime, then goes back to the moment, that same moment that we all share and some call eternity. Excellent. Thanks so much. That was Frank Ortega reading uh, Morning in a Silent Savannah Quarantine. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Excellent poem, Frank. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for everything. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Always fun to hear from you. Uh, call again soon. All right. Good night. Night. Okay, yeah. So let's see. So um, let's see. Um. Let's see, so Kitty Carpenter says she can't read because it's at work, but she emailed it. Yeah, so what I'm going to do every week is if you can call in, you can read it yourself, and then I'll pick a couple. We have to end by 7.30 at the latest, so um, we'll go for a little bit. Let me do, um, I have no idea who I'm calling here. This is a 218 number. And uh, and make sure if I call you to click off your stream or at least mute it wherever you're watching because I'm calling from the future. It'll be disorienting otherwise. Hey, this is Hello. Tim from Rattle Magazine. Uh, did you want to share a poem on the Rattlecast tonight? Sure, Tim. This is Kathy Gibbons. And, ah, um, hi, Kathy. I, can I just mute the, the Rattlecast? Or yeah, go ahead to... and mute that. Okay. 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 And I did send you um, a slight rewrite just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I see it. I have it right here. Um, so, so your poem is Minding My Ease in My Uneasy Days of Disease, right? Correct. Awesome. And and where are you calling from, Kathy? I can't remember. I'm calling from Houston, Texas. Ah, Houston. Well, good to, good to have you on again. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, and this poem, I was struck by Rosemary's wonderful reading and also by her speaking of poetry being a playground for people who love language. And this was totally came from a point of playing with words and also from my viral insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote some words that began with ease in the middle of the night one night, and I thought, oh, okay. So here we go. Minding my ease in my uneasy days of disease. Easy does it, say the experts, ebulliently unaware of ectoplasms running clear. Educate with efforts, unabated, providing for an egress into something less encumbering. But eh. Either option often is a false one. Ejaculations uttered, ekphrastic poems written to elevate, elucidate, embrace, embark, embargo, and enchant, enhance, and flower. 
throughout eons of epistolary efforts to equate, equivocate, eradicate, establish essence and esteem, etc., etc., then eulogize the evanescent every day forevermore with ewers of clear water springing forth to extrapolate exemplary samples of to be, and yes, arrange an expedition, extradition, extemporaneously eyeballing the way to climb back out of here, escape the unexamined ephemera of existence, eating up the world that sucks one down and in, exist as Azer, who can rescue, who can save, who can be strong. Eureka! Exclamation point. The end. Very nice. Kathy Gibbons, that was uh, Minding My Ease in My Uneasy Days of Disease. And you hear all those E's throughout the poem. Excellent job, Kathy. Thanks so much for sharing that. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for the lovely evening of poetry. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, so glad you could join us. Have a great night. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, let's see. So um, so Joshua Corwin says he's written a prompt poem already. Um, let me Let me call him up. <laughs> Yeah, so Josh has been on, on the Rattlecast before. We used to have an open mic that was um, up to anything. Yeah, Joshua Corwin, good to hear from you. Um, yeah, she's, she's still doing uh, her thing. Yeah, sh- shut off your YouTube stream or whatever that is and just focus on the, on the Skype. And then, yeah, because okay. you're, li- you're live right now. Can you see me? Uh, yeah, click your here, come. There you go, Joshua okay. Corwin, good to see you. Good to see you, are too, you, Are Tim. you watching me on TV, too? No, oh, okay. but I am going to put uh, Miles Davis in a silent way. Well, I, I did this in three and a half minutes. You wanted a run on? Here you go. Let's get a run on, yeah. It's called Oh Wow Images, in, inspired by Vicky Miko's uh, message in the, t- the YouTube chat before mine written in three and a half minutes. The most Buddha images sit in supported samadhi eternal now without a simple conviction without a simple existential thought to expose poly cannon blues overflowing the broad highway jazz closer to the realm becoming becoming ocean skies ricochet rocket rocket into the moment holy shrine of now oh m- Oh, mosaic body absolved into white noise, quicksand ant consciousness explode, alleviate the membrane, courses through cosmic veins, my wilted willow tree loins, period. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much, Joshua. Good to hear from you. You had a weird uh, feedback that sounded like some kind of strange chime music, too. It kind of added to the experience. Oh, it was In a Silent Way by Miles Javis. Ah. Miles yeah, I'm in that. That's a great thing. By the way, I, I'm going to uh, get that person for my podcast as well. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, good to hear from you, Joshua, and uh, take care. I'll talk to you soon. I, mean, I started teaching, and I got a book published, and I started uh, teaching as of last month poetry a year after graduating. going to look forward to the thing. Awesome. Congratulations, Joshua. Good to, good to hear that. Okay, good night. Okay, let's see who else we have here. We had... Um... Let's see, Kitty. Yeah, let's get a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Vicky Miko name dropped in the poem. Um, let's get, let's get. I think the only other person who wanted to call in is Richard Westheimer. So let's get him in. He sent a poem. I still have to read Megan's poem, and then and tell you about next week's Rattlecast. Um, Hey, Richard, glad to see you again. Let me pull you in just one second. Um, hello, so how are you doing tonight from Southern Ohio? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I love the, love the evening. Yeah. So. yeah, it's just, it's a lot of fun. I just love these. I, I love all the, the live video is so addictive. I, I'm a little, um, everybody's now finding out how addictive it is through the Zoom. Um, I was the only one who knew yeah. the secret. <laughs> but, um, but now everybody knows that it's really fun to, to connect with so many people around the world this way. Um, well, that, that, that's uh, what's been so nice about the two the two events that I attend of yours each week is just people from around the world and um, telling stories or truths yeah. from wherever they are. 
Yeah, well, thanks so much for joining us. You, your run-on sentence poem was Loaves and Fishes, which I have here, if you're ready. I sure am. Okay. Um, and here we go. Loaves and Fishes. It's unusual that clouds scud in on northerlies this time of year, winds which bring record cold unprecedented. They threaten not only the new blossomed buds, blueberries and strawberries just coming into their own, but will nip the potatoes exuberant and lush from previous weeks warm weather, lying in their gravid bed of soil, primed by timely rains, which have nourished collards too, and kale, all into seasonal plenty earlier than ever this year, making this unseasonable freeze easier to bear, and the work it will take to shelter the sensitive fruit to preserve their promise of an abundant summer less onerous. The labors of last year's careful tending feel less futile, not like the heartache that hangs over most everything else, what with missing picking tunes with my jam buddies, longing to break bread with my kids so far away, pissed off at those vigilantes and grifters making the news, and that neighbor of mine I feed from this damn garden snickering at my mask, which prompts me to think about another from further down the road who hasn't worked in two months, helping me out with chores, making half of what he's worth, making me realize I just considered a man being worth something like money rather than just worthy, which he is because he's the kind that defines shirt off his back and that he'd give you half of what he got, even if he didn't have enough. So protecting those berries from freezing means even more this year, because I will share with him for sure, even though I've made that sort of pledge in the past, but have mostly all, most always kept every last fruit for me and mine, my sorry sort of Trumpian tribalism. But now, for some reason, I finally get that he is mine, as are the grifters and the guffars, though I don't have to feed them, right? Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Richard. That's a great example of the way um, if you just let your imagination keep pushing forward, you end up in some kind of surprising, meaningful place, just sort of spontaneously. Yeah, it's like a run, a run down a very steep mountain. Yeah, it definitely is. Well, thanks for sharing that, Richard. Good to see you again, and um, yeah, I hope to see you soon. Yeah, thanks for the prompt. Yeah, Appreciate my pleasure. It. Good night. Okay, so I think... Um, Let's see. So, yeah, so we got We sort of have to wrap it up a little bit. I'm going to do um, Megan's poem. A whole bunch of people sent poems. And, and as, as always, and it was a really great episode to talk about this a little bit, because the point really isn't um, to publish poems necessarily. It's, it's the act of, of, um, of writing that, that we really want to encourage. So we have, um, there are a whole bunch of poems by other people that we just can't share. Um, I'm kind of glad that I didn't do a poem this week because then there's more time for other people. But um, let me do uh, let me do Megan's poem and then we will um, show you the prompt for next week. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, you know people wonder if it's okay to, to share these in this format and um, I think obviously it is. This is not um, they're not Googleable, so I think you can still uh, you know you're, you're using audio and video, but you're not using print or anything that's uh, searchable. So I think you just sent, submit these poems out of places and let me know if any of these prompt poems end up being published. We can sort of highlight some some past prompt poems that end up being published. Um, that'd be a lot of fun too, as the, as the time goes by. Now here's Megan's poem, uh, which I will read for her. And uh, this is Voicemail, May 2020. Hi. I just wanted to check in. These are crazy times, aren't they? Did you ever experience anything like this in your life? Are you out of toilet paper? Have you made bread yet? Have you dipped your oiled hands into a bowl of flour like a religious sacrament? Have you washed those hands while singing happy birthday and felt mildly insane? Have you snapped stay back to another shopper at the grocery store and been struck with the shame and wonder of seeing your fellow human as something Kafkaesque? Have you been... 
going for walks? And if so, have you walked begrudgingly or enthusiastically? Do you miss me? Do you miss the sweaty fog of standing in a tight line at the theme park on an August day? Do you miss the holy shower of spit from the pulpit on a Sunday morning? Have you taught yourself to knit? Are you making the most of it? Are you team let everyone die or team let everyone starve? Have you sung on the balcony? Have you wept into your mask in your car? Do you draw a sunshine with chalk on the sidewalk and call it hope? Do you touch the face on the computer screen and call it love? Do you need anything? Do you have a sore throat? Have you read the latest study? Can you call me more? Can you keep me safe? Can you believe we used to hug in the street with nothing between us but the future? So another great poem by Megan. She's a really good poet. I'm glad she's writing poems now. Um, And her prompt for next week is from the perspective of a spirit or ghost. So once again, that's next week's prompt. And that is from the perspective of a spirit or ghost. Um, And as always, you can submit them uh, to open mic at rattle.com. And um, if there's, and and then call in if you'd like to read it. If there's time and not enough people have called in, I'll just read your poem myself uh, as far as we can go. Uh, We do have a time limit though, unfortunately. Um, But these are really great and um, a great way to just spur some creativity in myself included because I want to participate as much as I can. Um, so once again, let me just tell you, uh, the prompt for this week is from the perspective of a ghost or spirit. So, so submit your poems by next Tuesday night. Um, and, oops. And, um, now I should say next week's guest on the old Rattlecast. Well, first let me remind you that there's a critique of the week every Friday at, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, where we go over a poem. Or two, I critique it, and we all learn from that fun experience. I really enjoy those two. I, I enjoy all three things that we do. Um, they're all fun for me. Um, and then we have the open mic uh, show for Poets Respond. It's Poets Respond Live. That's Sunday morning at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific, where we go over the poems we've picked for Poets Respond that week, and then you can call in and share your poems too. And um, I'm really going to focus on writing my own poems for this more, I think, since we're going to have a uh, poetry spot live every week. So I think I'm going to try to do a news poem. And then if I can do a second poem for the, uh, prompt, I will do that too. Um, anyway, so next week's guest is Meg Eden. And this is her newest book, Drowning in the Floating World, about the earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Meg lived in Japan for a long time. I think her father works there. I can't remember the, all the details of the story off the top of my head, but it's a great book. We published a poem from this um, actually, I have it right here. Let me, uh, let me just switch over to the screen view, and you can see it. This is a Tohoku Ghost Stories, and, um, and they're all... Let me just read this. It's going to be interesting. We remembered the old ghost stories, and we told one another there would be many new stories like that. Personally, I don't believe in the ex- existence of spirits, but that's not the point. If people say they see ghosts, then that's fine. We can leave it at that. And that's Mashashi... Uh, Hajikata from Japan, um, and a quote that Megan's been collecting these kind of uh, stories from Japan. And um, I will let you read that yourself at your leisure. Just go to rattle.com and type in Meg Eden. Uh, but her book, uh, Drowning in the Floating World, is what we're going to be talking about next week with Meg Eden. So, really looking forward to that. Um, thanks again for joining us. Please do click the like button and share and subscribe and all that good stuff no matter where you're watching this. And I will see you very soon. Have a great night. Uh, Good night.